This is our webinar series. Thank you. And this is our webinar series. We're going to be going through some great things today, uh, speaking about some ticketing bills. We've got a great team with us to share some more information. And before we get started, we're going to go over just some of our basic housekeeping. Let's see. So feel free to welcome yourself in the chat, share maybe a little bit about yourself, your name, organization that you might be affiliated with. And you can share the indigenous land on which you reside, um, if you'd like to share. And we have, I mean, excuse me, right now I am in the Central Valley on the Yokuts land here in the Central Valley in Madera, uh, California. And so please feel free to share that in the chat. Again, you heard the recording probably as you were coming in. So this, this event is being recorded. The recording slides and all resources will be shared with you all. So you can let be known that that will um, be sent out after this meeting and we'll also have it on YouTube. All right, so some of our meeting guidelines that we just wanna go over, uh, questions are welcome. As you see, this is not a webinar, this is set up like a meeting. So feel free to either raise your hand, put a question in the chat, questions are welcome. So feel free to do that. Uh, we're gonna try to avoid buzzwords. I know within the industry, it can be easy to give um, easy references or acronyms. So try to explain out any acronyms so that we can all understand. Uh, please feel, please be respectful of your fellow advocates here today right, and their perspectives and give others time to speak. We were also and if you are unmuted, um, please feel free, please mute so that as people are speaking, unless you're going to speak. Um, and if you're not comfortable speaking up at any point, you can enter comments or questions in the chat or follow up with us directly. And we'll put share some of our contact information in the chat also. So without further ado, let's get started with our discussion. I'm sorry, I have a, I was just explaining to the team, I have a fly flying around me right now. So I'm like swatting, I apologize. All right, our uh, moderator for today. Oh, I'm sorry, before we get into that, many of you know our organizations. We have two sister organizations, California Arts Advocates and California for the Arts, your statewide advocacy partner and lobbying organization. CA Arts Advocates does the lobbying in particular, and then CA for the Arts, we do our program services and advocacy network networking. And we do a lot of convening. Some of you probably convened with us in April for the summit or advocacy day. All right, so our moderator for this session is going to be Julie Baker. She has been our CEO since 2018 and has been a rock star in arts advocacy for many years. So I want to pass the microphone over to Julie to share more and to get us started on our discussion. Ah, oh, thanks so much, Nafesha. Welcome, friends. Um, great to have you here today. And uh, Julie Baker, I'm coming from the unceded land of the Nevada City Rancheria Nisanan, otherwise known as Nevada City, California. And um, I'm with me today are two, oh, I love the term rock stars because it's appropriate to this conversation today about ticketing bills. So we can go to the next slide. Um, with us today is Alex Torres, who I've worked now for years. Alex and I worked on um, funding during COVID together and the, the relief venues, um, the venues grant program, $150 million. Um, Alex has been an amazing lobbyist for arts and specifically for independent venues, and he's a policy advisor at Brownstein Hyatt Farber Shrek and the lobbyist for Neva, California. So welcome, Alex. And our next speaker also with us today is Gabe or Gabriel Docto. I call him, we, I think referred to as Gabe. Director of Operations at August Hall, San Francisco, and a leadership team member at Neva, California. So we're going to get started, and I think we can actually end the slideshow so we can start to see each other. Hi, friends. Hello. How's it going? And um, I just wanted to basically wonky Wednesday is, you know, we're, we're here to talk about things that are happening in uh, specifically, most of the time we'll be, we'll be talking about what's going on here in Sacramento and California and on um, public policy. So po public policies that will impact the work that you do in arts, culture, and creativity. And um, and to just share out um, how the process works a little bit as they we like to say the sausage making, how does this happen? 
and um, and so that people become even more informed as advocates and um, can also in the format of this is a meeting style so we can see each other. You can ask questions. It's meant to be informal. This is not going to be a super like, you know, buttoned up presentation as it were. So um, and last time we did one on the California budget. And this time we're going to be talking specifically about ticketing legislation and the legislative process. How does a bill uh, get Formed, how does it get made? How does that happen? How does a bill get passed into law? And um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna spotlight here Alex Torres, who's been involved with um, politics and uh, government for many years now. Um, Alex, um, please introduce yourself, share us a little bit about your background, and then if you could um, tell us just broad strokes, how does a bill get signed into law here in the state of California? Awesome. Well, thank you, Julie, and thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to, to be here today. Uh, as, as she said, Alex Torres with Brownstein Hyatt, I have the pleasure of representing uh, the National Independent Venue Association of California, representing over 500 independent brick and mortar venues, as well as festival promoters. And I'm coming to you today from uh, Nissan on land here in Sacramento. And so, uh, you know, I, I think uh, it can't be understated what a coalition of independent venues, nonprofit stages, presenters all came together to do music museums uh, to do a record investment uh, after COVID in the arts sector broadly. I think that, you know, um, as Julie said and alluded to, we had the, the opportunity to work together on, on those issues. Uh, I think now we're facing uh, down, the, down the pipeline of that advocacy, um, a lot of challenges for independent venues. And so um, in this case, you know, talking about the life cycle of the bill, um, or just generally any bill, really, um, you know, we, when, it, when a bill is introduced, it'll go through its first policy committees. So I'll, I'll use this example. This is in the ticketing space. So having to do with penalties for uh, fraudulent actors, for bad sellers, uh, making sure that there are registration requirements so folks know the legit ticket providers in this space with the Secretary of State the way folks would when they're starting a business. Uh, and so this in the assembly, it went through or in the, better yet in the Senate, the House of Origin, it went through the Judiciary Committee and, and then it went to the Appropriations Committee. If there's any cost to a bill, it goes to the Appropriations Committee. And I won't even try to get into the suspense file details because uh, I think by design, it's purposely not transparent. Um, but it, it, any bill that has a, a certain cost or fiscal tag to it goes to appropriations. And if it gets off appropriations, it goes to the entire floor for a vote. It needs to be read three times. And so the first two readings are, are more, more or less procedural, uh, but it's voted on a third time and then it transmits over to the other house. Uh, in this case, a Senate bill goes to the lower house, the assembly. Uh, it goes through generally the same process. There are slight slight differences in terms of the committees in the Senate and in the Assembly. So, for instance, in the Assembly, we have a Privacy and Consumer Protection Committee and an Arts Committee. The Senate does not have an Arts Committee, uh, nor does it have a Consumer Protection Committee. It has a Judiciary Committee, which is generally all-encompassing, or sometimes it can go to business and professions in the Senate. So it just depends on uh, what the Rules Committee thinks it should be referred to based on what code section it's amending predominantly. Um, and then, uh, as I said, if it goes to two committees, it's called it's uh, what we call double referred. So it goes through two policy committee votes. Uh, and so in the case of this particular bill, um, it is it is double referred in the assembly. To, it was heard in the arts uh, committee and then it is uh, it was just heard and passed out of the privacy committee. So now that it's been amended in the other house, in the assembly, it needs to go back to the Senate for an entire floor vote on concurrence. So that's basically the Senate agreeing in what the assembly amendments. Um, and thank you, Julie, I'm referring to Senate Bill 785, which uh, of course is the, uh, the crisis uh, issue du jour uh, of ticketing, uh, the ticketing bill of the week that we are dealing with this session. Um, and as I said, it goes back for the Senate for an entire floor vote to concur in the assembly's amendments and, uh, and then uh, transmittal to the governor uh, where he ultimately decides whether or not to sign it. Um, and so broadly, you know, in broad strokes, that's that's kind of the life cycle of a bill. The cleanest bills have single policy committee referrals, meaning that it's heard generally in the same committee in each house. Uh, depending on any changes made, it might need to go back to the house it was introduced in, the House of Origin, uh, to be passed by that body as well, then go to uh, to the governor's desk. And, and just quickly, because I missed it, but by way of background, I've had the opportunity to do uh, 
policy politics here in Sacramento for the last 10 years or so. Um, I'm born and raised in Sacramento. I'm, I'm fortunate to have been uh, raised around the Sacramento political climate. And so now I, I uh, am honored, privileged to uh, have arts, the arts economy, uh, arts-based businesses uh, be a, a large portion of the advocacy work I do in my role as a contract lobbyist. That's great, Alex. Thanks so much for that overview. And again, anyone who wants to ask a question, please raise your hand at this point. But just to also kind of give this is like a little bit of 101, but Senate, what SB stands for is Senate bill, AB stands for assembly bill. The numbers are, you know, just that's what you, how you look it up. And often a number is reused. So you have to put it by the year that we're in. And then you'll see often in parentheses afterwards a name. So in this case, it's Caballero. And that means that Senator Anna Caballero is the one who introduced the bill. So that's the author of the bill. Um, Alex, if you could talk a little bit also before we um, get to Gabe um, about just when can advocates and when can uh, people who work with lobbyists, where do they insert themselves in terms of influence and at what, what times and what is the level of influence that advocates and lobbyists and the groups that they represent can have on bills like an SB 785? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, the sooner the better. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of making sure uh, and I think, you know, it, it, if you're, uh, you know, labor, for example, there are certain uh, groups in California politics that have the ability to come in whenever, um, you know, uh, I, I think for Neva, where my Neva hat specifically, we pride ourselves on our scrappy nature. And so um, we're, we're going to lean in however we can. But we also in, in the arts world, generally, the strength is in numbers, the strength is grassroots. And so the policy committees really, I, you know, labor does this to great effect, and I'm a big fan of emulating it. It's why Neva is so, help, so uh, I think, impactful in the building and why you all are so impactful when you show up uh, to your arts advocacy days um, in showing it, its physical presence in the committee rooms. Um, and Julie, you'll know when labor likes something, you'll have 30 uh, laborers or 30 sheet metal guys in line, all in their neon, uh, ready to support something. And that goes a long way, that time and attention to showing up and showing out uh, really does make an impact. So uh, just some general points, I think, on advocacy. Um, if there's a bill, don't wait. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of the sooner you raise your concerns, the sooner you get you kind of wrap your head around what the author wants to do with it, the better. Um that, that gives you, I think, a little bit more room for conversation, especially if it is something that there is a truly misguided author who really does not understand uh, a sector, for instance, and you need to do some education work before you can kind of get them to the pitch of this is how you need to change it. And so that education work take, takes time, I think, particularly in, and Julie, you know, we've, we just went through this with another ticketing bill, um, with, whether nonprofit stages uh, or for-profit venues, um, the ticketing landscapes are very different. It's not a one-size-fits-all example. They have different business models. Legislators need to understand that before they can then get to the what do you want to do about it. And so I always like to give myself plenty of room to do the education because sometimes they're not out to get you. They just don't understand it. And so you need to do that education. And then you'll have not only a well a, a better versed legislator on the issue, but you now you'll have a vehicle for amending and you'll have plenty of room to work on the technical implementation. And so that's like the best case scenario timing wise. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of opportunities, as I said, committee hearings are great, but um, I think as long as you're not at the last step, which is the floor vote before it's sent to the to the governor's desk, um, you, you're usually there's there's no such thing as too late. Um, it's always important to to make sure you're you're reaching out, especially if you know a legislator is not meaning to do something that may inadvertently cause harm to your sector, to your operation, et cetera. Um, I would say another piece that folks. Um, you know, really work hard and increasingly these days have been working hard has been the governor's office. Um, when you have a governor that um, is very wary of headlines and very focused on making sure that unintended consequences don't become a front page story, 
uh, there is an administration and, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's to say that's sort of the governor's MO, but his team are remarkably competent. They're very detail oriented. And so even mm-hmm. don't despair when a bill is on the governor's desk that you may not like, or maybe you're for it and the opposition seems insurmountable or difficult. Um, if it's on the governor's desk, you're still alive or you still have a chance to, to get it pulled. Uh, and so don't forget that critical piece and that, um, you know, if you can mobilize social media voices, media, um, you know, folks calling into the governor who may have those personal connections. Um, that is another opportunity. That's sort of a, you, you don't want to like, let it be your only advocacy strategy. Um, but it is an important part of that mix. That's great. Well, thanks, Alex. I think it's important for um, folks who are here today and others who are will be watching this as recording to understand that you have a role in this, that you can um, advocate and, um, you know, look to your advocacy organizations like like ours, like NEVA, um, to, to help summarize bills, to pay attention to what's going on, because in an average year, I think about 2,000 bills are in- introduced. So, you know, our organization will track anything that we believe is going to impact arts, culture, and creative work workers and um, in the industries. So um, we'll be looking at that. But, you know, early on when the author introduces and if you see something, as as Alex is saying, that feels like it would cause harm to your um, ability to do your work, that's an important time to raise our voices and to mobilize and say, you know, what we would want to see different in the bill. And that's when you can say, would support, for example, but with amendments, right? So there's positions that you can take on a bill. You can oppose a bill to say this bill <laughs> outright, no way it will it be a good bill. You can support it, say this is a great bill. You can sponsor a bill, right? You can be the ones who actually say, we'll help to make sure that there are um, there's awareness about it and that people are writing and support letters and you're providing the evidence, everything else. And you can also support with amendments as as we've all done on many bills, particularly around the ticketing space. Um, So there's different positions you can take. And the thing I think is important that Alex was explaining too, is that there are very few legislators who are going to be issue experts about every type of industry in the state of California. And what they look to in the sector, whether it's our organization and, and the folks that engage with us or the, um, you know, and there's many crossovers with Neva and us, et cetera, they're going to look to us to help them to understand our sector, right? And to understand how to do this in a way that doesn't call, cause unintended consequences, as Alex was speaking of. And, and then, of course, yes, again, too, really important that all of this happens in the legislature, but ultimately goes to the governor's desk. And the governor has the opportunity to sign or line item veto, right? Or, or right, just say, no, this bill, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sign this bill. Sometimes there's letters attached to when the governor signs or doesn't sign a bill, and the, he'll explain why that is. So that's an interesting thing to learn from as well. And finally, you know, if a bill doesn't get through the House or uh, any um, through the legislature or doesn't get signed by the governor, it doesn't mean it doesn't get reintroduced the next session. And so we constantly have to be watching out to see what's being introduced and what is the influence we want to have on that. So just kind of big picture, um, everyone here on this call and anyone listening and involved in advocacy, there is a role for you in this. Ultimately, legislation is trying to solve problems, right? So what is the problem it's trying to solve? And um, what is our role to influence that? So I want to switch to Gabe. Gabe um, is uh, a, an amazing advocate um, who uh, is now part of the leadership team at Neva California. And then I want to get into some of the specifics of more of the bills that we um, all have been working on and Neva has been leading on as well. But Gabe, can you give us a little bit of background? Because one of the things I think is important for folks to understand is that while um, Alex might be, you know, a contract lobbyist, um, Gabe is an advocate and that there's a difference there. And Gabe, why don't you explain sort of how you got into this and, and what your your origin story is? Let's not go back to birth, but like, you know, a little bit. Where'd yeah, you come from? Uh, thanks, Julie. Thanks for having me too. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, I think, you know, just a little bit of background. I am uh, the director of operations at August Hall. So I'm a venue operator. Um, I've been in the industry for about just over 12 years now. I started as a stagehand. Um, at the Berkeley Greek Theater in 2012 um, and have kind of been hopping around venues um, ever since until I landed full-time at August Hall. Um, 
I think, you know, the origin story for advocacy for me is uh, 2020, which is, I think, a lot of um, our industry's or origin story as far as for-profit uh, concert venues go. Um, and I got involved, um, I think I actually saw Allison Moulton on this call. Um, I got pulled in by Allison Moulton uh, to help form the San Francisco Venue Coalition during the lockdown. Um, obviously during lockdown, none of us were in operation. Um, we were all in dire straits, no money coming in, uh, a lot of people being laid off. Uh, and it was very, uh, very apparent from the outset that, you know, if we didn't take action quickly, um, that a lot of the venues were going to go under. So I started on the city level, um, kind of in parallel while uh, we were doing city advocacy, the national effort for NEVA was also underway, um, lobbying on the federal level. Uh, and through San Francisco Venue Coalition and a lot of the coalescing that we did with other cities, that was kind of almost a natural, um, uh, just a natural Venn diagram that came together with, you know, Santa Barbara, LA, the East Bay, um, and that through, and Sacramento, of course, and, and through all of those um, small regional coalitions was kind of how New the California was formed. Um, so I think, you know, something that I would underline having gotten into this um, as not a professional uh, lobbyist, as not a policy advisor, um, was this just, we just kind of fell into this through necessity. Uh, we needed to take action in order to save our businesses, in order to save a lot of jobs, in order to save our ecosystem. Um, and, and through that, we were learning on the go. Um, I think a lot of what we've accomplished, we wouldn't have been able to accomplish without um, Alex, who's kind of guided more of the formal process of how to do these things, tempered a lot of frustration um, that we've had in terms of how slow the legislative process moves. I think our industry is very result driven. Um, we're very used to, we're, we're lining up a show, we execute the show, we move on to the next show. Uh, and that's not always, um, advocacy is not as linear uh, and as results driven um, as the industry that I come from. Um, and in that sense, there's there's been lots of talks that I've had with Alex that's just, be patient, take your time. We're, we're going to get this across the finish line. Um, I, I would also say, um, even though it seems like there's a lot of obstacles and a lot of gatekeepers to get into advocacy, um, I constantly remind myself of how surprised I am and, and how easy it was to actually start getting involved. Um, it's, you know, Level one, um, having done this for a little bit now, level one is, is literally just picking up the phone or, or writing an email um, to your representatives. Um, actually, sorry, that might be level two. Level one is finding out who your representative is um, and then picking up the phone and or, or writing them a letter um, to talk about the issue that you either um, identified that's coming through in legislation or the issue that you feel like isn't being addressed through legislation. Um, and then I, I think from there, you're trying to find people that are telling the same story, um, that agree kind of with the issues that you're trying to solve um, and bringing all of those people together um, to advocate on, on that issue. Uh, and I, I think uh, something that I think discourages a lot of people um, and that I um, was educated on and getting involved in all of this is um, the barrier to entry is, is much lower than you think it is. And I think um, just paying attention a lot of the time uh, will help you get involved if, if that's what you're looking to do. And there's a lot of people that are doing this out there um, to help guide along the way. I think uh, California for the Arts has been uh, a great partner and a great advisor as uh, NEVA has formed and especially the California chapter specifically. Um, and there's you know a lot of crossover uh, in the advocacy. So finding partners, finding allies uh, and, and boots on the ground uh, has been huge for us too. 
That's great. I mean, I, I just, I really can't say enough how important it is for folks to recognize that you can be involved in this process and how critical it is that we are involved in this process. We can influence change in what happens in the legislature and in the administration, and you don't have to have a deep background in it to get involved. In fact, when I started uh, in 2018, I had never done this work uh, directly in terms of working in, in you know, in advocacy and, and lobbying uh, and working on bills. So um, encourage everyone to it's and Gabe, I think you have some fun at it too, right? It's not just frustration. Oh, yeah. it's fun. I, definitely. I, I think, you know, despite pulling back the curtain on a lot of stuff in terms of how uh, politics works, that's kind of, I think, where um, some of the frustration comes out. But it, I mean, the, the work that we're doing, and Alex reminds me of this all the time, the work that we're doing, uh, we've seen a lot of success in and that success uh has a big impact on our ecosystem even if it's small impacts that we're chipping away at i think that's something that i try to remind myself of too um, the legislative process and, and the political process moves slow so little wins uh are wins and they make big impacts um especially in a sector that is relatively new to advocacy um we're seeing results, we're seeing engagement from uh, policymakers, we're at the table. Um, we're, we have legislators picking up the phone to call us about bills and how that might impact us. Uh, and you know that stuff that if you were to ask me about in 2019, I wouldn't be able to tell you anything about it. Um, I would have been, you know, shocked that it was even being brought up because it had nothing to do with the show that we were running that day. Um, but, uh, you know, when you zoom out, um, the stuff that we're advocating, especially right now in ticketing, will have uh, an impact on people that work at the venue that I'm running, um, the frontline workers, um, people that are dealing with customer service issues. Some of those customer service issues we're hoping will go away with some of this ticketing policy. So, you know, yeah. just making people's day-to-day -day lives that much easier um, because we all have a lot going on. So uh, let, let's get into the specifics. Um, let's talk about some of the bills. So if we could, um, and Alex, you can jump in here. Let's talk first or either of you, let's talk first about the one that just became law on July 1st and what that means for anyone who is selling tickets to a performance. Um, I don't know, Alex, if you want to take that, I think it's SB 478. Yeah, so that was that's really was intended to be that sort of all in pricing bill to prevent. I think you know, yeah. Again, Taylor Swift becomes uh, what what comes to everyone's minds, or at least what uh, is referenced by legislators with kind of the targeted intention um, for who they're trying to capture. Uh, so you know, larger ticket providers that uh, you know weren't providing a clear picture of uh, of any charges, uh, stuff like uh, airlines who you know by the time you you get ready to close out. Uh, you're you're charged a hundred hundred and fifty dollars more than what you thought you were going to pay, um, and you know I think there's there's been some studies about once you're so far along the process and then you get the, the, you know kind of surprised by these fees at the end, um, you're you're still more like you're you're still probably going to buy it sadly uh, and obviously not great for the consumer, um, so that was the stated intention and kind of you know scope of of the bill, uh, but when I think you you got into the implementation side there was a lot of um, jurisdiction for the attorney general to determine exactly how this would be implemented. And San Francisco, for instance, uh, for those of you from the Bay Area, might be familiar with a, uh, how San Francisco helps make sure the folks working in restaurants have livable wages. Um, in addition to paying min minimum wages to charge like a kitchen fee, a service fee, um, and that this would have effectively disabled their ability to do that uh, or, or uh, it, it, uh, made it illegal to do that. Uh, the attorney general made a far broader read, I think, than what was intended by the author of Senate Bill 478, that is Bill Dodd from Napa. Um, and so restaurants were coming out saying uh, what the net result here will be is that we will have to raise rest, uh, prices on our menus uh, in order to comply with this. And because we can't have these additional charges to help fund uh, 
you know, uh, back of kitchen or front of house staff more equitably, um, you know, we will lose jobs because of this. Our hours of operation will likely be less. Um, whole host of issues. So the California Restaurant Association set about uh, advocating for a fix to that. And that fix came about at the, in the form of SB 1524. And that was authored by uh, by Senator Weiner and uh, Mr. Matt Haney, from San, both from San Francisco. And uh, I think one piece that we were really, uh, from the venue side, we're really excited to see is that it also includes uh, food concessions. It defined, so it's restaurant, bar, food concession, grocery, grocery deliver delivery service, or banquet services. Um, which casts a broader net um, on applying or com complying, better yet, with uh, the mandates of 478. I think as far as the, the ticketing requirement things, um, from our standpoint, the primary ticketing provider that would that it, that's sort of on the primary provider. But for those of you, as as I've learned, and Julie knows, uh, you know, uh, some of you don't even use a ticketing provider. Some of you are using a CRM. Some of you are using, uh, you know, sort of a different arrangement. Um, I think it remains to be seen how that will be interpreted. There could be some, I think, technical fixes that could be perhaps required or needed from this sector for the, those fixes. Um, I, but I think one big major issue, again, because of the focus on restaurants, was how do you do a food concession? How do you avoid, uh, you know, or not better, uh, avoid isn't the right word. How are there, how is it feasible or practical in order to comply with 478 when you're doing food concessions uh, in a venue uh, and you're, you're not necessarily, op you're not a restaurant. And so that was the big concern. That fix is just, was just signed by the governor. Um, let me share, I'll, I'll share it in the chat when I have a second. I can hear the press release from the California Restaurant Association, as well as a link to the bill analysis that provides a little bit more information on that fix. Um, but I don't think this is a seen the end of a 478 fix conversation. I think that's going to be something that'll be likely picked up in January as more and more folks um, Look, July 1 was the compliance date. From what I gather, a lot of folks are not yet compliant. Uh, they don't know what compliance means uh, for their sector. Um can you just uh, describe exactly what 478 requires people to do, though? Can you just outline that for a second? Yeah. So it, it essentially, all in pricing mandates, it requires that every aspect of of uh, you know of of basically any anything that is marketed, um, anything where you know whether it's a quote, you're imposing additional surcharge, that it be uh, displayed to the consumer up front. Um, you know, and, and ticketing all in pricing is sort of uh, it has been uh, a, a really important point to be uh, transparent for consumers. And so that in, that includes all surcharges, any sort of uh, uh, additional fees that that you'll see on a ticket. And, and in the instance of charges that um, weren't line items like a kitchen or a front of serve a back of house kind of fee, it would make that illegal because it's not clearly delineated as going towards one purpose or the other. So, so if you're buying a ticket at a venue now based at starting July 1st, it either needs to say the total price is $55, let's say, and then um, there's nothing when you get to checkout that then says $55 plus $6 for a venue fee plus, you know, $10 for, um, you know, the nonprofit uh, contribution or something along those lines that it has to all be displayed right all from in. the get-go. So yeah, you, any, it's illegal to advertise the price that isn't the price you see at the end. At of the end, day. okay. And so, again, like I said, well-intentioned, but the, yeah. the implement, when you when it talk when you talk about fees like these restaurants in San Francisco, where that's particularly notable because of the high cost of living um, or concessions, it's like how, how, how do we comply? Things like, you know, things maybe that some of the nonprofit venues are dealing with. So I don't know if anyone here has questions. I see Todd from movie theaters. If anyone has any questions about that, please feel free to either raise your hand or comments about it, uh, things like that. And what Alex is saying, too, is that in, come January, when we start the legislative process again, um, uh, you, you could see more what they call like cleanup bills or fix it bills based on 478. So if more people are starting to say in in implementation, this is really challenging because of X, Y, and Z. So yes, does this apply to nonprofit operations as well? My understanding is it does. 
Yeah, my understanding is yeah, if you're if you're putting something on sale, my understanding it, it was pretty broadly applicable is my understanding. But again, yeah. I think I'll share the analysis of 1524. Um I'm I'm cursely curious because Gabe had raised this was something that some of our member venues had flagged uh, by the you know, obviously well past the time 478 has passed. The way we saw it was like it was just an all-in pricing bill. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, most of our primary providers already do that um, or they've signed a pledge to do that. So we're already kind of on that path. No big deal. Right. Um, but again, just kind of the way it's written, it impacts, you know, uh, venues like most businesses have a couple different forms of uh, streams of revenue and concessions is one of them. Merchandise is another one. So um, how do we make sure that there are not impacts there? How can it be expressly or better yet, more explicitly stated that, you know, kind of we're not the droids you're looking for. You're going after Ticketmaster and Airlines. Um, you know, we want to make sure that our operations aren't uh, unduly, uh, you know, inhibited by having to comply with this. So like I said, uh, it, it, with 1524 having been signed, I think less than two weeks ago, um, okay. I think there's going to be a little bit more of a settling in period in the next couple of months. We'll start to hear rumblings of that. Um, very possible through trailer bill and budget language that there's some additional tweaks. That's that's sometimes how things work. Uh, the new leadership has said that they don't want to do any uh, policy changes th uh, through fiscal vehicles, through budget bills. But um, they're, the legislature is a fan of, of having rules until they don't have them. So, uh, I, I, you know, it remains to be seen how this end of session will, will go. But I, will, I think you will likely expect something in January to maybe tweak some additional pieces of this. Right. So, again, just in terms of the process, you know, even though sometimes bills get signed, that doesn't mean that there aren't additional bills that then try to fix the unintended consequences of a bill. Of course, I know a lot of us worked on AB5 and we saw that in a number of uh, cleanup bills after AB5. OK, so now let's go into SB785, which is um, Cab Senator Caballero's bill. We've all been working on that now for several months. Um, I don't know, Gabe. Do you want to kind of give an overview of what that bill is, and and or yeah, does that are you sure? Yeah, yeah. I think right. um, you know, there's been a number of ticketing bills that have uh, come in the wake of kind of the the Taylor Swift headline uh, debacle. I think um, Neva California has been playing a lot of defense on a lot of those bills, and we're excited uh, to have uh, SB seven eight five as a bill that we're actually supporting because um, it act it. it tackles a lot of the issues that venues are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's a lot of um, to do with fraudulent ticket sales, speculative ticket sales, um, mostly the resale secondary market. Uh, and, and this bill is poised to ban a lot of the speculative ticketing. So that's banning um, the sale of a ticket that you don't actually currently have yet um, even before a show goes on sale we have resellers out there that are promising um, seats and promising tickets to these um, it's also going to increase fines um, for the use of bots to buy ticket sales which is big um, it's already illegal to use a bot to buy tickets and scoop up a lot of tickets but this will increase penalties for doing that um, it's going to ban the sale of uh, a single ticket on multiple platforms, which means you can only sell resell one ticket one time to one person and not five. Um, and uh, one of the things that's kind of nuanced in this bill, uh, but that's going to make a big impact is this bill is going to define um, a consumer as uh, a fan that has the intent to go to the show. Um, and, and, you know, that sounds kind of silly. Uh, when you're talking about this stuff, because who else is buying a ticket? Um, but that's actually going to be a definition um, that makes a really big impact in being able to regulate a lot of the bad behavior that we're seeing on the secondary market um, and in ticketing resale. Um, it does a lot more, too. Um, I think Alex can chime in if, if I'm missing anything that's really pivotal. But I think um, ultimately what we're trying to accomplish with this bill um, is to regulate bad actors in the secondary market uh, and give access to fans um, who actually want to attend a show. Because on a day-to-day -day basis at every show that we have, whether or not it's sold out or not, whether or not it's Taylor Swift or someone you've never heard of before, um, we're seeing a lot of people and a lot of fans come to our doors with fake tickets, um, tickets that have already been used, um, which basically means they can't get in. And they paid 
um, a lot of money, probably too much money. We're seeing inflated prices. Um, a lot of face value tickets that are $35, we're seeing go for $250. um, on the secondary market. And there's no guarantee that you're getting through the door because that ticket might be fake uh, and that ticket might have been used already. Um, So those are the the practices that we're really trying to combat with this because um, one, it impacts the fan. They're paying a lot of money uh, and they're getting to our doors and they're not getting in. Uh, Two, it impacts the venue. uh, That depends on attendance. Uh, Venues, profit, margins are pretty slim depends a lot on bar sales and concessions inside the venue once you're there and if fans can't get in because scalpers have bought all of the tickets uh and haven't been successful in resale or are just selling one over and over and over again uh we don't see the attendance that we need to see uh in the venue uh to make it profitable uh and artists are also getting um hit by this because you know fans can't get into the venue to buy merch or they're spending too much money on the ticket itself uh, in order to be able to afford the merch or the concessions inside. So this is something that um, may sound trivial uh, kind of when you get introduced to it, but the the impact that it's going to have is going to radiate throughout the entire ecosystem. Um, And, you know, ultimately this is a consumer protection bill that you have businesses advocating for. I think one of the unique things about this bill um, and probably our industry in general is, uh, you know, the product that we're selling uh, relies on physical attendance to use that product to be successful, um, as opposed to kind of going on and and buying um, just an item on Amazon, that transaction is over. Um, When you buy a ticket, the transaction and the business transaction is not concluded there's still more to do uh, maybe even months down the line when you attend that show um so you know i i I can't stress it enough that this is a consumer protection bill and and the whole industry um and primary market is getting behind this from sports teams um to venues nonprofits, um and and the impact is going to be radial for sure and i'll just add that for California Arts Advocates, we also worked on the bill because originally the author had it actually exempted nonprofit venues. And we have heard from many people in um, from Cal Presenters and all the different groups that we work with and AXO, the symphony orchestras, um, that uh, this is happening in nonprofit venues as well, right? It, it's not just to the independent for-profit venues, but nonprofits are experiencing where people are coming with tickets that don't exist. They're being told people are actually putting up sh- saying that a show is happening at a venue that isn't even happening at that venue and people are buying tickets. And the problem that, um, you know, Gabe's venue and all the venues that we talk to as well is that uh, the the venue gets blamed, right? It's not the secondary ticket market, um, you know, system that created that problem. So this bill is really trying to fix that. And um, we made sure that nonprofits actually were not exempt in this case because we wanted to make sure nonprofits received the same protections under this law. And that that change was made. Um, so we are grateful to the, the senator and to the consultants on the committees for making a lot of different changes to that bill. Another, I'll, another key piece, add, yeah, that, go ahead. just to add one key piece, because you, 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 you called it out, is the misrepresentation of what the ticket uh, offers or what it provides. So, you know, uh, it, it could just be a complete and utter, you know, misrepresentation that it's, you know, it's at venue X when they're not even doing that show, or it could be an artist meet and greet that is promised. And that's why the ticket's $300. Uh, and then you show up to, a, a, a you know, a, 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 to Harlow's here on J street and, um, you're promised, uh, seated with a, a seated opportunity with dinner and an artist meet and greet when it's a standing room only venue and they don't do dinner like that. So, uh, you know, th- that, that's the type of, uh, practices you're seeing. And this is not just to, to pick on, you know, the secondary platforms, um, although they are fighting this bill quite hard, um, 
but uh you know this is also just from your your bad actors who have been doing this you know for for decades right it's the 1-800 we have the tickets.com that isn't even a really a real provider they just are really good at creating a fake website and have a payment processing back end so uh the one one other provision it's very it's 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 hidden amongst all these other great provisions is a requirement that ticket providers that uh that are putting these tickets up for sale register with the Secretary of State. And I think the intent there is to weed out, okay, you have your, you know, CTICs, Eventbrite, you're like legit ticket providers. Um, and then you have your 1-800, whatever ticks. Uh, those folks aren't going to register with the Secretary of State. So I think that's a really helpful, it's a subtle provision, but to Gabe's point, it's kind of just a, a bite at the apple um, for this truly consumer bill. And if I could, Julie, just kind of touch yeah. on, because I, I think it is really um it's a little upsetting in a, Cal in a state like California that prides itself on consumer protection, uh, but also protecting businesses like ours, like Neva, like all of your nonprofit stages, to see consumer groups opposing this bill. Um, and I think it's it's the playbook that the secondary market has done in different states. Neva has kind of been fighting at this in different states, and I know Cal uh, Americans for the Arts have been really engaged at the federal level as well. Um, but they're saying, well, if you if you inhibit the secondary market, you're basically helping Ticketmaster because you're killing their competition. Couldn't be more wrong. Um, folks in the industry, uh, I had to hold Gabe down when he heard this on a Zoom meeting we were with the other day. because Or in uh, testimony. This, or, or in testimony. <laughs> well, the worst part of this came from the speaker's consultant on the issue. Uh, and so, you know, part of that is that education. I, I also, again, sometimes Gabe has to tell me to be patient. Sometimes I have to tell him to be patient. But, uh, uh, you know, it's it's part of the challenge in sausage making and the fact that just as Neva and all of you have advocates, the other side has advocates and they have five or six advocates. So, um, you know, it's it's a it's an up it's a tough battle. Um, I think we're, we're doing well so far. Uh, but the the fundamental uh, this goes back to a not understanding the industry and b um, you know kind of mischaracterizations from the opposition uh, the not understanding the industry is if you're if you're for the bill then you're obviously for Live Nation Ticketmaster and you're you're a plant for them um, we have to then explain that Neva represents the largest sector of competition or a largest sliver of competition to Live Nation's venues in this sector. Um, but even then, that's not that's not good enough uh, to some members. Uh, and then you get into them not understanding uh, the issue. And the issue is that they look at everything in kind of a flat plane and that um, if you're if you're competing, it, it, then you're competing. And that's a good thing. And what we're trying to say is that the secondary market has harmed California businesses, nonprofit stages, artists, uh, and they're continuing to try and expand their foothold in California. That's why they're opposing the bill. Uh, and that's been the hardest piece to break through so far on this is that um, members fundamentally don't understand the issue. Um, it is a complex, admittedly, ticketing is very complex. Um, Turns out. <laughs> yeah, but but it's also um, you know damn good public affairs by the uh, by the opposition. To, yeah. uh, so, if the Live Nation checks are coming in, I I must have missed mine in the mail. But <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about next steps on this specific bill SB seven eight five. It just got out of um, privacy committee. It's in the it you know started in the Senate. It got through the Senate as was. Then it got amended in the Assembly. Um, uh, with influence from Neva, with influence from California arts advocates and others, um, and um, and now now what happens? So it goes to the Appropriations Committee, where it is put on the purposefully not transparent suspense file. And the challenge with this is the chair is Buffy Wicks from Oakland, who had run a bill uh, earlier this year that uh, Neva California Civil Arts were in an oppose unless amended. It would have allowed the secondary platforms access to all of your inventory, uh, multiple platforms all at once in the attempt to create competition in the primary marketplace. Uh, of course, that would have been unworkable for a whole host of reasons. And you're, you're opening up the... Uh, the uh, hen house to the foxes, so to speak, uh, by allowing all of these different platforms or being forced by the state to allow by law different platforms access to your inventory, uh, nonprofit or for profit. Um, that bill is gone. That bill, that bill is she's held it for this year, but unfortunately, she is still not happy of our concerns. Um, and the opposite, the, the folks who supported her bill are opposed to 785. 
I uh, told so, you, everyone, this is getting wonky, right? It, so, it, it is quite interesting. And so going into the Appropriations Committee, Ms. Wicks, during the committee hearing uh, this last week in, in privacy, she's on, a member of that committee, uh, expressed that she wants amendments because she doesn't want to kneecap the secondary market because they represent competition. And so she wants to uh, try and fix, you know, make the bill better and come to a compromise with Senator Caballero, the author. So, so we have a lot of concerns. the Live Nation Ticketmaster monopoly with this idea of competition, right, in the marketplace for ticket sales with then what we're all experiencing, and I say we because I used to run a venue in terms of uh, ticketing fraudulent practices by certain actors in the secondary ticket market, that's being conflated. It's there are two separate issues, but starting to it continues to yeah. have some sort of filter and influence on on bills like SB seven eight five. So it, it'll come down to, you know, continuing to push Miss Wicks and, you know, um, one of the nonprofit stages, uh, one of the oldest nonprofit stages in her district uh, ended up testifying in opposition unless Great amended to Miss Wicks bill. And so I think part of it is going to be the the strength and, you know, our, our one of our member organizations another planet operates a couple of venues in her district. So it's going to come, it, this is again, kind of bringing it down to the grassroots level. This is really where the strength in numbers and having all of your individual stages, your organizations um, advocate on it, on, on these issues is, uh, you know, members don't really, they, there's a huge disconnect when they come up here to Sacramento. They, they know the stages, they know the artists, they're friends with venue operators, restaurant owners in their districts. Uh, but they, when they come up here and they hear talking points, they don't necessarily put the two and two together. So our attempt, I think, here is to drive it home to Miss Wicks that, you know, um, we agree with you. There's a lot of issues with uh, antitrust and the monopoly, but um, we need to address these issues that venues have been arguing for for years that are issues that we're dealing with. And um, 785 does that. It's a pro-consumer measure. So we're going to continue to push and advocate. Um, and we're hopeful. I, I think the beauty of having Senator Caballero as an author. She's also chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Usually there's a little bit of uh, uh, mutual respect between the appropriations chairs. Uh, they say, in the they say I'll, mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you your five, your five favorite children if you share the same uh, courtesy uh, and they let each other's bills out. I think Miss Wicks is, um, she has bigger fish to fry, frankly, I think. Uh, and that's kind of what I think she realized that the ticketing game was a, a, a tough fight for her to be in. That's why she held her bill. Um, so I'm hoping she will come to a similar uh, uh, conclusion with our bill and, and let it out uh, in as close to current form as possible. But the fight continues. So just so everyone knows what that means is so right now the legislature is on summer recess. Right. So um, they will come back. Um, I don't have the date in front of me. Um, do you remember what the date is, Alex? I'm sure you know. Uh, yeah, it's, it, there's all I know is it's like the, the last week in July. And yeah, so they'll come back in early August yeah. and then we'll go back into committee hearing. So this is when the bill will go to appropriations. Full transparency, because this is part of being wonky Wednesday. We have a meeting, the three of us with others on, on our team, um, both at NEVA and California Arts Advocates, our lobbying organization, to talk about strategy as the legislature comes back, how to get you all involved to make sure that SB 785 gets signed as it is or close to as it is with all the amendments and all the negotiations and the influence that Neva California, California Arts Advocates, Music um, Artists Coalition, and um, a number of other organizations have worked to really influence. So stay tuned. <laughs> in other words, uh, you will be called upon, particularly those who are in Buffy Wicks district um, as it goes to appropriations. And then the games continue in terms of once it gets to the governor's desk, again, we need to make sure that the governor sees that this is an important bill for all of us. So really just wanted to, to highlight that all of you have a role in this. Final five minutes here. Give us an idea of what is Fix the Ticks. There was a big national movement yesterday. Hopefully everyone signed. We did some amplifying of it yesterday as well. This is on the federal level. Give us an idea of what is Fix the Ticks at the federal level. 95% of what's in 785. It's pretty great. <laughs> so we're... We're playing, playing leads. <laughs> We're playing offense on two fronts. Um, you know, when Billie Eilish uh, posts something, uh, a, a, a lot of different artists and bands, Under Oath, one of my favorite bands, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
the Variety, Rolling Stone, they all covered this phenomenal advocacy effort. I'll, I'll let Gabe, Gabe speak to it a little bit, but it's, I think, a true, true testament to that grassroots strength. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, everything that we just talked about for SB 785 is what we're trying to push for on a, a federal level. I think the importance of uh, SB 785 can't be understated because California sets a precedent, policy precedent for the rest of the country um, a lot of the time. So, you know, victories here uh, and defeats here can echo across the country. Um, and, and you know, that's why we want this bill to pass because that'll help set the precedent and hopefully kind of create um, a gravitational pull to consumer protection on a federal level that we're advocating for. Um, I think kind of more of a closing thought too and zooming out on more of the advocacy um, level in general, I think one thing um, that I get reminded of during this process specifically, um, as we're watching you know, companies and corporations throw thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars at trying to prevent this um, is Neva is not, uh, doesn't have the financial power um, that the other lobbyists and the other corporations do and the grassroots effort uh, and the success that we're seeing in the grassroots effort um, should be, well, you know, it can be frustrating to be outspent um, is still extremely encouraging to see that, you know, picking up the phone, sending that letter, posting on social media, having a conversation with each other is still making a huge difference and a huge impact in pushing legislation forward. And I think, you know, as there's a lot of uncertainty in the political field right now, um, in general, I think that that's something positive to hold on to that engaging actively in the democracy, in democracy and the political field um, is actually still getting stuff done, even if you don't have the dollars to spend. I love that so much, Gabe. Thank you so much. I mean, I think, you know, you've heard our, uh, Governor Newsom, I'm sure governors before saying as California goes, so goes the nation. I think that's important in terms of understanding why we really need to push for 785. So we will activate those and in this network who are on the call today, those who are watching. And if you've got networks of networks, please share out as we're going to- Or testimonials really quickly, Julie. This is yeah, really critical. Please. Testimonials for when you've had to greet a crime fan because they bought a fake ticket or if they paid $300 for sometimes tickets that were free, but they were on Eventbrite. So a, you know, StubHub or Vivid snapped it up. So those testimonials are really critical because again, we need to continue to illustrate that this is not just a Neva problem. This is not just a, oh, well, you guys do outside lands, so you're fine kind of, you know, issue that legislators can dismiss. This is an issue that everybody generally faces. So testimonials are also graciously appreciated. Gabe's yeah. uh, and I's inboxes are open. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, we'll give you all the tools to be able to activate in the next couple of months as we hope to get this bill onto the governor's desk um, in a way that we've all helped to shape it. Um, and all, similarly to Neva California, California Arts Advocates is a small organization in terms of we do not have those big dollars either. Uh, this is scrappy work. This is all of us showing up. And that's why all of you show up on Advocacy Day in April it is so critical um, to um, you know them recognizing that we are mobilized. I'll tell you this, we know this in terms of the California budget, which was last month's um, conversation, you know, with the May revise really wanted to cut so much in arts funding, as well as many other pots of funding. But obviously, what we care about is the arts in this particular organization. And, um, you know, we were able to mobilize quickly, we were scrappy, we and we were able to get 75% of that funding restored in the final budget. So it does work. Advocacy works. I know this is, uh, this is definitely a through line for us in wanting to do Wonky Wednesday to give you guys the inspiration and the tools to feel engaged and empowered to activate, to be a part of democracy, to be a part of the process. It is power to the people, right? This is where the people come in. We don't want the corporate efforts to be what controls what happens in terms of laws, in terms of everything that you everyone here is trying to do. It's not why you go to work in the morning uh, is, is you want to make sure that people are engaging in the arts, have access to it, and are not getting um, hurt by um, bad actors, as it were, so that these this kind of issue is trying to solve. Well, my friends, it's one o'clock. Um, Alex, Gabe, thank you so much. I, I learned some things. I hope others who are listening learned some things. 
these two are terrific partners in crime here and all good things that we're trying to influence at the legislature. Please join us in doing all of this work. I'm going to put up a quick slide to show you how you can, or we can put it in the chat, how you can engage with Neva California, wonderful organization we're thrilled to be working with and who are becoming members of our organization as well. So thanks to, to them for joining um, California Arts Advocates, our lobbying organization. So with that, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Um, or to Neva, to the folks here. And um, we'll be coming back in August with the next Wonky Wednesday. Where we'll start to talk about local advocacy and local advocacy wins. What can you be doing in your city or county and discussing specifically what that looks like. Um, maybe we're looking at some conversations around Prop 28 implementation, what you need to be doing there. And then also um, specifically around potentially things around like getting film offices put into different uh, communities around California. So lots more to come. Thank you for joining us. Thanks again, Gabe, Alex, and to everybody uh, who showed up today and to the awesome California for the Arts team. Thanks. Thanks for Bye. having us, Julie. Yeah, you bet, Gabe. Take care.